Here are the steps for completing the square to solve a quadratic equation. The first step is to get your variable terms on one side of the equation and then move the constant to the other side. Simple enough, it's just a simple manipulation of the equation. Step two says to divide all terms by the coefficient of x squared. Now the reason we want to do this is so that we have a lead coefficient of one. Now steps three and four I tend to do these guys together because they're so connected. Step three says to add the appropriate amount to both sides in order to create a perfect square trinomial. And then four says you're gonna factor that trinomial as a perfect square. Well, if you know the amount that you're going to add to both sides, that means you already know how that trinomial is going to factor. And so I kind of do these guys together, which we're going to see here in just a moment. And once you have that, that square set up, that parentheses with the square on it, you can then use the square root property to finish. And that's what completing the square is all about. It's about manipulating the equation so that you can use the square, or so that you can use, yeah, the square root property. I don't know what I was thinking. There. So let's take a look at this example. x squared minus 14x plus 53 equals zero. So the first step is to move the variable terms on one side and get the constant on the other. So that's simple enough. Just move the 53 to the other side. So then we have x squared minus 14x, leave some space, and then we have negative 53 on the other side of the equation, just like that. All right, step two is to divide all terms by the coefficient of x squared. Well, the coefficient of, of x squared is one. If I divide everything by one, nothing is going to change. So step two is pretty much already done for us. Now, steps three and four require you to find that missing piece and take that trinomial and factor it as a square. So I suggest that we do this all at the same time because in order to find what goes here, you're going to be finding the number that goes here. And it's a simple pattern of divide this by two to get the number here, and then square that number to find what goes in the gap. So divide this by two, we get negative seven, and negative seven squared is positive 49. So by having a positive 49 on the left side of the equation, it gives you a trinomial that factors as x minus seven times x minus seven. In other words, x minus seven squared. Now in pink, I added 49, so that changes the equation unless I also add 49 to the right side, like this. So now this creates balance. I needed this 49 so that I could factor on the left side. I needed this 49 to maintain the balance. So we end up with x minus seven quantity squared is equal to negative four. All right, well now this is just a simple application of using the square root property, right? So take the square root of both sides. Don't forget the plus or minus, just like that. So we've factored and we're using the square root property to finish so x minus seven is equal to plus or minus, the square root of four is two, and the square root of the negative is going to give us the imaginary unit i. And then of course, the final step, we need to add seven to the other side so that we can finish isolating our variable. So x is equal to seven plus or minus two i. And you see that since we have a solution that contains i, there's really no point in separating out the plus and the minus. This answer right here is good enough. If you wanted to separate and say seven plus two i and seven minus two i, you can, but there's no other work for you to do. Now, one of the things I wanna point out here about using uh, completing the square and what makes completing the square a nice, easy process to use is you want a lead coefficient here to be one and if the coefficient isn't one, get it to be one. And once this guy's one, you want this middle coefficient here to be even. You may be going, why do I want that to be even? Part of the process for completing the square is to divide this by two and then square that result. What kind of numbers do you like to divide by two? 
even numbers because when you do that, you won't end up with fractions, right? So if that's what we see, if we see a 1x squared and we see an even coefficient, completing the square might be a pretty good thing as long as the equation doesn't already factor or you know use the square root property. All right, so let's try another example. Okay, let's take a look at 2x squared minus 52x plus 194 equals zero, and let's go through the same process, the same steps. Okay, so the first step is to get the variable terms by themselves. So we need to move the two or the 194 to the other side. So 2x squared minus 52x leaves some room, and we end up with negative. 194. All right, so that's step one. Step two is to divide all terms by the coefficient of x squared. So that means I need this guy to be a one, so I'm dividing everything here by two. Okay, remember there's a reason for this. We want this to now be a positive one x squared. This is minus 26x equals half of negative 194 is negative 97. All right, now, like I just mentioned, completing the square can be nice and easy as long as this lead coefficient is one. Well, it wasn't one, but by dividing by the lead coefficient, it's now one, therefore the x squared. You also want the middle coefficient to be even because I'm going to have to divide that by 2 and square it, right? So this is even, this is good. I don't really care what this number is over here. I'm doing the correct work, so I know he's fine, uh, but he doesn't really matter so much, okay? The only time I might be, con I might be concerned is if he were a fraction, uh, but that's going to come up a little bit later. <laughs> I know you can't wait. All right, so now we're on steps 3 and 4, so I know... I'm going to create a scenario so that I have a binomial square on the left side. But I've got to figure out what goes in that. Well, I need to do half of this guy. So when you think about that, that formula that we had, it all kind of connects back to this. Where I had x plus b squared, and I showed you how that becomes x squared plus 2b x plus b squared. So we are saying that negative 26 is twice b. So to find b, we do half of that, divide by two. So half of negative 26 is negative 13. And then we square that to get the b squared to get what goes in the gap here. So negative 13 squared is positive 169. And we also need to add that to the right side of the equation, right? We can't just do it to one side. You have to do it to the other side so that you can maintain balance. All right. So now, let's see what we have. Negative uh, 97 plus 169 is going to give us 74. Nope. Just kidding, 72. See, should've been paying more attention. But you know what? Sometimes we make mistakes, right? So you got this mistake, you can show it to your friends. Hey, my math teacher made a mistake because he was thinking about something else. But you know what? You'll never know. Yeah, man, I don't know where my head is. Can't even tell you. 72. Oh, goodness. I guess it's just one of those days, right? All right, so now that I have this set up, I've factored as a perfect square. I added the right amount. I'm now going to use the square root property to finish this. All right, so let's take the square root of both sides. Don't forget the plus or minus. And now we have x minus 13 is equal to, and how do I want to break down 72, or can it break down? Well, 72 will break down as 36 times 2. And again, both of these guys are in square roots. 
and we know the square root of 36 is 6. So that's going to aid us to get plus or minus, there's my 6, and the square root of 2 is going to stay as it is. And the final step is to move the 13 to the other side. So plus 13, plus 13, and x is equal to 13, plus or minus 6 times the square root of 2. All right. Now, you saw that I made a mistake earlier, right? And I could have kept going with that. Um, something was telling me that it was a little bit off. And I, of course, I had my numbers uh, swapped around a little bit. And sometimes that happens, right? I know you've all been there. Uh, so let's make sure that we can check our work, right? Let's use our graphing calculator and check, right? So on the graphing calculator, let's type in our answer. Now, we can't do plus or minus. We can at least do one of these. Let's take 13 plus 6 times the square root of 2. I've got to close off my parentheses. And let's use that store key that we've talked about. So let's store this into x. All right. So it's some crazy decimal. Please, please, please don't try to give me that as an answer. I'm going for exact answers, and this is what I want. If you type your answer in my math lab, they want an exact answer, unless they say round to the nearest, you know, whatever. What I'm going to do is I'm going to type my original equation and see, do I get 0? So if I type in 2x squared minus 52x plus 194, what do I get? I get 0. Now, if I had done it the wrong way, where I had that 74, I would have said 13 plus the square root of 74 and store that into x, and let's see what would happen here. It's still another crazy looking decimal, right? And if I type in my original equation, I can use the arrows to go up and grab that, I end up with 4. So I would have known that my answer was wrong, which would mean I need to go back and figure out where I made the mistake. Uh, sometimes it's an issue with signs or just a simple arithmetic uh, mistake. But this is why we can we have the calculators to check our work, not to do our work. And of course, it's simple enough to go ahead and try uh, 13 minus 6 square roots of 2, store that into x, and see what happens when I evaluate 2x squared minus 52x plus 194 and I get 0 so both the plus and the minus version of my answer works so yeah I'm good so make sure you check your work don't get going too fast and don't make careless mistakes but we won't talk about that right